Uh, schools are announcing layoffs across the United States of America, and that's unfortunate also. Make sure y'all hit a like for the algorithm, subscribe to the channel, turn on your notifications, and then make sure y'all tap into the Patreon link is in the description. We reported Tuesday on teacher shortages around the country. Florida's vacancy count was among the highest in the nation. So why then, a writer for the Tampa Bay Times asks, are schools cutting jobs? Missoula, Montana public schools are also facing layoffs, the worst in a generation, according to their superintendent, also cutting staff, school districts for Fort Worth, Texas, and San Diego. The Northwest Indiana district announced it's closing three elementary schools on top of previous announced layoffs. Mm. District employees spoke out against the decision Tuesday night. It's like I'm in twilight zone. No one is considering our children. Indiana School Board Association Co uh, Code of Ethics says children are number one. How are we considering children in all of these cuts? Health and safety. Bathrooms not clean, desks not clean. I'm expected to be highly effective with 34 children in my room. Honestly, there's not gonna be a lot of teaching going on. It's mm. going to be survival of the fittest. <laughs> Welcome to the terror zone. Welcome, this is spreading across the, across the United States of America. It's multiple different reasons and it's multiple factors, but this is what y'all wanted, right? Do you know what funds your schools? I agree, Rhonda. America is crumbling. You know what primarily funds your schools? You know why people are walking away? You know why teachers? This is the real doom loop. This is the doom loop, right? The doom loop is usually uh, referencing cities. And that they say that, A, this part of the city is crumbling or this part of the infrastructure is crumbling. Not infrastructure specifically, but, you know, with regard to, like, let's just say crime is running rampant. Then businesses start to close. Then jobs start to walk away. Then property values start to go down, which then turns into schools not getting as much funding. Businesses don't want to put businesses there anymore. People start to devolve into poverty. Then you start seeing drugs, despair, crime rises. That's the loop because as it continues to get worse and nothing comes in to make that change or, or to dissolve whatever it is that's causing for that to happen in the first place, everything gets exponentially worse. And the same thing that's happening to your neighborhoods, your communities, ultimately your schools. And it's the same thing as far as the doom loop, right? Tearing up the properties, property values go down, crime rises, less funding goes into the schools, more people coming into the school district, especially with regard to the migrant crisis, teachers get paid less, P teachers want to leave, you get a worse teacher that comes in, parents are worse than ever before, the teachers then become overglorified babysitters because there is no home training. And then it's becoming survival of the fittest because you have an overabundance of people inside of one classroom. So there is no real learning. And then the more worse kids is more disruptive. And then if you say anything, then the parents come up there and they discipline the teachers and they treat them like trash and so on and so forth. And so it's not that the kids come first. It's the culture that you need to fix, which then creates the environment that's conducive for the kids to learn it. And so it then becomes a doom loop within your school system. You will say, well, they don't care about the kids. I say you never cared about the kids in the first place. And CBS News reporter Bo Erickson has been looking into the teacher layoffs, and he joins us now. Boas, tell, tell, tell me more about what's happening in Indiana specifically. Yeah, why we're zeroing in specifically on this school district is because the impacts are already being felt of these layoffs. They were immediate layoffs, 173 staff positions, and a kind of this mid-sized city have already left the school district. These are janitors, support teachers, English as a second language teachers, recess aides, all very important positions to make the school day function. And specifically today, there was an unintended consequence of all of mm. this. Uh, about 300 staff members called out mm. uh, for work, which made all the schools close today specifically. Wow. 
Yeah, because when those when those 173 go, all of that work doesn't go away. It just all goes on to the existing the teacher, teachers yes. who are left over. Um, why is this happening around the country? And the this I'm asking about here is not only, okay, we talked about teachers leaving yesterday, but when teachers are leaving, why are layoffs still happening? You'd think they'd be doing the opposite, right? Exactly. We need more teachers, but the help wanted signs are being taken down specifically. And it's really being described as a perfect storm of three specific issues. Remember all that federal money coming from Congress during mm -hmm. the COVID pandemic, it was about $200 billion. That money is going away. It cannot be relied upon anymore. We also have inflation that is rising costs. And the third aspect here is enrollment is down on many schools across. Enrollment are down. Have y'all ever been to count day? Y'all know what count day is? Count day is the day of the year that most schools, well, I know that that happens in Michigan, but it's basically the day of the year for uh, the county and the state to determine how much money goes to what school depending on how many kids are enrolled. So if enrollment are, is down, let's say you have a huge city. This is what happened to Detroit back in the day before we started making our comeback, right? What happened was you had a city because we had so many jobs, and similarly what happened to Flint. You had a city that had so many jobs because of the auto industry, and it was booming. So everybody moved up to Detroit. And it was at the forefront of the movement of what the middle class truly was, right? Then you have the 67 riots. 67 riots was the precursor to what was going to happen to the city over the next several decades. And so you had white flight. So the people at the time that had the most resources decided that they wanted to leave. Uh, we got uh, different mayors, such as Mayor Coleman Young, that then ran the city like the mob. And it was pay for play in a lot of instances and in a lot of areas. Um, black people basically controlled the whole city, but they didn't know how to run anything. It was a lot of pilfering, a lot of stealing, a lot of run running it into the ground. And so they took everything they can while at the same time the economy was crashing in 2008, in which the union was already dwindling. So a lot of the jobs and the fact that we didn't change and evolve and to become something more than just an auto industry center, which we are now, then spelled your eventual demise. And so what happened is a city that was originally built to hold 2 million people, then dwindled down to roughly 700,000 people, right? And the surrounding areas was thriving. Macomb County was thriving. Oakland County was thriving. All of these places was thriving. But Wayne County, specifically in the city, was suffering. Was suffering. And then as soon as you got one tumultuous season of the pandemic, or and or the recession, not the pandemic, with the recession, the housing recession, and the auto industry really started laying off everybody because they couldn't even afford to keep their doors open and they had to seek out um, bailouts from the federal government, everything just went to hell. Everything went to hell. And they had too many schools. They couldn't keep it open. Enrollment was down. Uh, you still had people that wanted to send their children to public schools. The property values was down, which then contributed into the schools themselves. And so you had to have somebody and a group of people that had to make a major reinvestment in order to then drive growth back into the city. And that seen it as an opportunity, a buying opportunity, which Dan Gilbert, the Illich companies and so on and so forth, then capitalized off of, which then is driving all of the growth back into the city and, and the redistribution of wealth and the expanding of different industries beyond the auto industry in order to make sure that the city is coming back. But my point is, is that that is the doom loop. That is the thing that then forces the cities and the schools and the layoffs and the lowering and because of the inflation is so high and, and uh, all of this other stuff, that's the thing that ultimately drives you into bankruptcy and drives your kids into poverty because you don't have anybody that really cares about the community, which is the constituents, the residents, the people within the community country, which kind of lowers the money that states are giving to school districts. You mentioned yesterday about the inequities when it came to teacher shortages, that there were inequities in, in the way that was being spread out. What about these cuts? Are there inequities in the same way with that? Yeah, we've been trying to figure out all day long how many teachers could potentially be laid off. And there's about 13,000 school districts around the country. And the best sense we have found is about half or a little more of them said there could be layoffs coming this year. And so there I talked to an expert. Her name is Marguerite Rosa. She's from the Edge 
Regionomics Lab at Georgetown University, and she gave us a better sense of which types of school districts could be impacted by layoffs. How widespread may this be throughout the country? The layoffs will be greater in some of our highest poverty districts, the larger high poverty districts, because they got more money from the federal government. And so when they spent more... So, Eric Daniels, this answers your question. You said the federal government don't want to fund the schools. That's not true. The people are supposed to be funding the schools because the federal government get their money from the people. So when y'all get these stimmies and they give you all this free money, all they really creating, they're mortgaging your future to ultimately sell you off on what it is that you're supposed to be voting for now. So you say, oh my God, they got all of this COVID money or whatever. Okay, so you drive up inflation and you, you drive up the cost of doing business and the cost of resources. Everybody think they got free money, but it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable because you still need a strong economy and community locally in order to keep the schools flowing and doing well. The state government, okay, so you're saying a state government. Okay, cool. So how do you decide what community gets what resources depending on um, how many students, how many people live within that community versus these people over here? So let's say you got this community over here, right? Community A. Community A has a boom in economy, people that care about their community, people that communicate in their schools, go to work every day, take care of their properties. They pay way more in property taxes, right? Because the foundation of the schools is based off of what you contributed in property taxes. Okay, cool. So you got all of these people over here and they paying an egregious amount of money in property taxes. Then you got Community B. And Community B don't give a F. Community B like, we don't care. We gonna run it up. Guns everywhere, depressed properties. We want to defund the police, all of this stuff, right? Now, they not paying no money in their property taxes. Section 8 housing, uh, all trash. We don't care about our schools, all of that, right? But you got more schools in a depressed area and less schools over here, but these schools are funded more because the people actually care about their community and they pay their property taxes and they're driving up growth in their city. But then you got people over here that don't really care, right? And these are the people that need it the most. These are where the teachers are getting laid off. This is where uh, the schools are being depressed, where you have parents that don't give a piss. They stealing, they tearing up the books. They throwing graffiti on the walls. How do you decide that you want to take money from this people that contributed into their space and give it over into Community B just because you're, suppo you're supposed to be a diversity, equity, and inclusion and it's funded by the state? From a C student's perspective, when we break this down line by line, property by property, property tax by property tax, when you have less than a 8%, 5% voter turnout, people don't care about the millages. They don't care about the how much the, the, the uh, economy or the, the, county, the county itself and what their um, investment grade rating is and all of this stuff. When you think about that and you break it down, you can't just singularly say, well, the state government don't want to fund the schools. No, the people don't want to participate in the success of their children. That's what it comes back down to. The people don't care about the success of their children. And so what they do is they blame it and they pass blame on everything and everybody else. But the reality is that that's why Massachusetts kids had the highest test scores. They appropriately funded. No, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. It has nothing to do with funding. See, this is a disingenuous argument from people and that they always want to just narrow it down to funding, but it's much more complicated than that. It's much, much, much more complicated than that. Way more complicated. It got more money from the federal government. And so when they spent more money, that create, now creates a bigger hole in the prior year's budget. It is going to be uneven. It'll also depend on what the districts use their money for. If they use the money to hire a lot of people, that means they've got to let them go. 
Some districts have warned them, said, you know, this is a temporary job. When the money runs out, the position is gone. Um, and that still can be confusing to employees. So they, they might have heard that, but thought something would change. So um, I had another segment that I was going to share in this whole segment, but for the sake of time, and I want to get to the other aspects of what we're talking about on money. Oh, I'm wrong on this one. You think I'm wrong on this one? I tell you what. I tell you what. I'm going to do something rare. I don't usually do this. But I tell you what. I'm going to drop the link in the description. If you disagree with me, you don't have to be on camera. I'm not going to pull y'all on camera. I'm going to read the super chats. And I'm going to drop the link in the description. Or the link in the chat. That's for the chat. Y'all help me to understand how I'm wrong. Explain it to me. I'm a C student. I'm trying to understand it. I don't know what's going on when it comes to the schools. Only if you disagree with me, this is not a coaching session, any of that. Very rarely do I drop the link inside of the description on the Millionaire Morning Show. But I'm going to give y'all a couple minutes so that y'all can help me to understand how I'm wrong. Tell me. I'm open. 